Hello, and welcome to part 21 of my Hogwarts mock series. You might have noticed that for our second update in a row, we've not actually got any of the Hogwarts buildings here, and that's because today we're going to take a look at some of the smaller details in and around Hogwarts. I'm calling this my micro builds video, um, but that's just a kind of catch all for the different details that I'm going to look at. And plus that, I'm also going to take a look at my minifigure stand, the rotating uh, turntable stand type thing that I use to display minifigures, uh, mostly in set reviews, which has also been requested. So I'm going to go through each of these different things in a little bit of detail. I may have covered some of them um, very slightly previously and just show you how I've made them and hopefully give you some inspiration for your own mocks um, or just uh, show you how they're done for anybody who is curious. So we will start with the most basic, I think, which is the Hogwarts Brazier. And there we go, that's a nice close-up view of that. So uh, when I say this is a simple build, it's simple to the point where I don't even really need to take it apart so you can see what um, it's actually made of. Just these one by 2 uh, profile bricks, uh, I think originally created to look like wooden palisades. They come in one by 2 and one by 4 lengths. Obviously I've used the one by 2s here. Um, and then two 2 by 2 plates in dark tan. I will just pop this off so you can see what's underneath. A little bit difficult there we go under that is a two by two round tile with the hole in the middle and then fixed into that to reverse the direction of the studs is a dish piece a two by two dish which goes into there that's in dark tan it's a bit of a tight fit it is a legal connection in there but it does it does feel a little bit like you're forcing the pieces but uh, i believe it is correct fitted into that is a one by one uh, hollow stud so the one with the room to put a bar through the middle and that's in trans orange and then fitted into that is a small flame or plume piece again in trans orange. Uh, I tend to put it that way around so that that is facing outwards. Uh, tried a few different things for this brazier um, you'll see what it's meant to look like and this is the simplest design that I could work out that still looked roughly in scale with the minifigures. Um, it's a design that's easy to replicate, doesn't use too many pieces and there are quite a few of those dotted around the castle. Next, we'll go on to the library where these two builds come from. You may recognise them from my video on the viaduct entrance building, but I will show them again in just a little bit more detail here. First of all, starting with the bookcase here. Now, as you can see, this bit is actually separate. You see more of those profile bricks in uh, reddish brown this time. Uh, this doesn't actually connect. It requires putting on a base plate for things to actually connect. But as you can see, that then creates this small shelf that sticks out at the bottom. Um, I'm using as a base down here the 1x3 jumpers with the two studs, one on each side. One of these modified bricks here with the groove down the middle, just for a little bit of added detail. This side faces out towards the back of the building, the open side, and this actually faces, uh, faces towards the wall so you can't see it. Um, there's more of those two by three, not two by three, one by three double jumpers there. And then in order to hold these books, um, I've actually just used um, tiles and plates of various descriptions here. I'll just take that off so you can get a better view. So you can see these are just stacked tiles, uh, essentially, and some plates with rails on the side. And other places, I've got these two by two jumper plates, um, which allow me to offset some of these. You can see that means that this looks like it's sticking out on one side. And these are all held on. I just remove all of these by four two per shelf of these modified bricks these are the one by one by one and two thirds modified bricks with two studs on the side relatively recent um, although they're in tons of sets now and that just means that these will perfectly fit um, if you don't know the ratio is five plates equals two studs width so this is five plates tall one plate shy of two bricks so that's how this is all held together and then in order to create the smooth surfaces you've just got these modified plates or tiles however you want to think about them with two studs and that just allows each of these to stand by itself trying to put it together on camera um, allows that to be offset i think i have worked out how this all goes back together and then the entire thing is just capped off with um, a two by four tile at the top and you can slot these in there. And I have managed to actually put the whole thing back together, he says. 
there we go. And then obviously that is just free floating. So that's the bookcase. I have got three of these in my library. They're all built exactly the same way, just with some variation in terms of books. Okay, the second bit of the library that I'm going to show you is the globe. Now, I based this off a photo of one I think I found at the uh, library in Oxford, where the scenes in Philosopher's Stone were filmed. Not sure if it actually appears in the film or if it appears again, but it was a nice little addition. So for those of you who don't know, these globe pieces are fairly rare um, and they actually are made of two pieces. <laughs> and inside is a little Harry Potter Easter egg. This is one of the old Ron Weasley hair pieces, which is just on top of a uh, one by one round brick and a one by one round plate. The reason I've done this is that there are actually no uh, stud connections on this. Um, the two pieces clamp together, if I can get that to work. And then underneath you see this hole. Now this hole is the same size roughly as a stud or an anti-stud, although it's slightly bigger, which means there's no clutch when you put them together. What you need to do is sort of secure it around the base of uh, a piece like this, and it stays like that. Trouble being it then rattles around, so what I've created is a little uh, buffer kind of thing inside. So that goes on there, that goes on there, and that's much more secure. It means it can still spin fairly freely. Um, I've seen similar solutions in um, official Lego sets using the old sort of burglar style hat, um, but this is the one that I came up with. Underneath is a three by three dish in reddish brown, just to reverse the studs so that this can actually stand up. I have just got, uh, again, one by one, oh, I'll get them apart, one by one, hollow studs and then the one by one tile with a bar on the top those two just go like that and then I have them this way up so that these four studs can sit between studs on a base plate so that it has enough clearance this is half a stud all the way around enough clearance away from the wall incidentally there is just a reddish brown bar going all the way through the middle which connects everything together okay moving on to the next section Yes, it's another bookcase. This is a much simpler one, which I think is more obvious how it's built. Just pop the top off so you can see. It again uses these uh, modified bricks with the two studs on the side. In this case, it still uses four, one, two, three, and then four here. And then going into the middle, we've got plates and tiles again, two tiles that meet up in the middle so that everything works smoothly. And then on each level below the top, we've got one of these modified pieces with no studs in the middle, and that obviously just allows these books to sit neatly there. Standard 1x4 on the top, which allows the detail of these slopes and these two studs, and then there are just two studs underneath on each side, which prop it up. Got one of these in my uh, quad building, and another one sitting in the Hufflepuff common room. Speaking of which... It's a chair, and it's a chair in particular from the Hufflepuff common room. I did show these off uh, very briefly in that video, but I just thought I would show you uh, how these are built. Um, this isn't really my own design. It's a design I copied partly from Hagrid's hut, partly from the central perk set. Um, you may even be able to tell how it's put together without me taking anything apart. It's just a base, which is actually four by three studs in total, just two pieces making that up with some round studs on the bottom to act as feet. And then it uses a combination of plates and uh, curved bricks or curved slopes, however you want to think about them. I'll just pop off that tile there so you can see the shape. Let's see if it'll actually come off yet. Bricks like these, four of them used, one for each of the arms and then two for the back. And it's just layering of plates there, um, making sure that the plates overlap so that everything is nice and strong. And then everything's finished off with tiles on top. Just leaves a two by two area in the middle so that somebody can sit down. Uh, and again, the use of these round uh, studs on the bottom means that it can either sit squarely on the studs or between the studs to give a little bit more clearance. There are two of these in my Hufflepuff common room and they are exactly the same. Moving on up through the castle, we get to Dumbledore's office. We've got three pieces here, two of which are actually from the office, and one is the gargoyle underneath. Pop this out of the way for now, and also this, and we'll have a look at Dumbledore's chair. Now, I spoke about this when looking at the uh, original Grand Staircase Tower in that video, uh, but I just thought I would focus in on it a little bit again. So I had an interesting time designing this chair. 
this is what it's uh, kind of supposed to look like, although it's also a mixture of Dumbledore's chair in the Great Hall. Um, I originally designed it with a 4x4 footprint, but then putting a minifigure in it, it's so oversized, as a lot of things tend to be with Lego. So I managed to fit a design which is actually 3x3. Three You'll see underneath that they've got three along here, three there, so it's a three by three square, and that meant I had to use some pretty uh, creative building techniques in order to get a minifigure in. So you'll see there's another one of these one by three jumpers with the two studs, two upright brackets, one by one brackets there, and then these modified plates with bars on the side, and that just creates the front of the armrests. The back itself is actually hinged just here. You've got the hinge clips and bars there, which all locked in underneath. And then the back is actually held together with uh, connections which you'd think would be quite weak, but actually turn out quite strong. Got a few of these ingot pieces in various places, two of them to work as the rest of the armrests, which means there's still space to put a figure down in the middle there. Um, and then the back is held on with more of those two by three jumper plates. You can see one here and there are two more there. And then you've got the pentagonal tile upside down, which connects this final bit of back. Two more uh, one by three tiles there in dark red, which I just thought was a nice bit of variation. So that is Dumbledore's chair. Again, this sits between studs because it's three by three. So sitting between studs means it can sit directly behind the desk and also gives a little bit of space so things aren't too tight a fit. Okay, and speaking of the desk, there it is. This is closely modelled after the desk from the films. I tried my best to approximate the details, although it's using a very small space. Um, as you can see, it's a 2x6 build overall, um, and indeed it uses a 2x6 plate as the basis, with two of these modified 1x2 rounded plates as the feet. And then we've got some ornamentation using another one of these bricks with the slot down the middle, two of these scroll bricks with one by one round tiles underneath, a standard one uh, by six brick and a one by six plate to make up the back. And then we have more modified plates with the rail on the side there. And then the surface of the desk is just made up of three of these modified plates with the two studs, which means you can get some nice smooth areas on the areas that aren't covered. On the corner, I've just used a telescope and a Technic ball joint piece in white to represent the lamp that normally sits on the edge of Dumbledore's desk. This letter can sit at an angle. This is an older letter from the original Harry Potter theme, which I still have. This here represents Dumbledore's sort of writing desk portion. It's just a standard one by two cheese slope. He's also got a quill in an inkwell there, and then this slope, which, uh, to be honest, I'm not 100% sure what it is, but it's a nice little bit of detail which helps to flesh things out. Rounding off Dumbledore's office, rather just below it, we have got his gargoyle. Now, you will have seen in a more recent update that I went back and moved this so it was underneath the office, and you get a better view of the archway that I created for it just there. Um, this just allows it to sit in the corner of the tower and take up as much space as possible and also just hides the grey piece around the back. So you can see the entire thing is built around one of these camera pieces, what I like to think of as a camera piece. Um, so it's sort of a modified brick with then this bit coming off the side. I know it was used in one of the early snow speeders as a cannon on the back. And I was limited elsewhere by the number of pearl gold parts. So you can see, for instance, I don't think they make 1x2 plates, but they do make 1x2 jumpers. So I've used quite a few of them. And also gold slopes of the curved and cheese variety. This at the front, which represents the beak of the griffin, although it's actually described as a gargoyle in the books and everything is held together fairly well. Um, I initially thought of using these wings just here for Dumbledore's lectern in the Great Hall, but then I, I tried it and realised just how massive they are um, in comparison to how they're meant to look, but they are perfect for this gargoyle. These tiles just here function as the, uh, the legs effectively, making it look like it's uh, sitting on its haunches, and then these two modified plates with the bars on them represent the feet. And then everything just sits there and lines up perfectly, he says, as he's not able to get it to line up. There we go. So that sits nicely on another jumper just there. The legs sort of lead down into the feet. And then I can pop this arch back on there and everything uh, 
just about works. There is the gargoyle. I'm pretty happy with that build and I think it works very well. Speaking of gargoyles, we have got one more. This was a viewer request to see how I made these gargoyles. If you don't recognise this, it comes from the Great Hall. I originally had a slightly different design, but I realised it really wasn't accurate, so went back to the photos and made something that was a bit more accurate. So there are two parts to this. You've got the actual gargoyle itself and then the dish that hangs down underneath it. Those function as extra lights around the uh, outside of the Great Hall, a lot as well as the floating candles. You can see I've just used a one by one round plate in there uh, in trans orange to represent the flames and one of these modified uh, bar pieces with a stud on it to act as the chains hanging down. For the gargoyles, I have kept to a very simple design. We've got a cheese wedge under there holding it up and then underneath that is a modified brick with a stud on either side. I then used these sort of tooth modified plates to act as the wings which are folded back and then these uh, curved one by one slopes to act as the pillar and then above that is plates sticking out which then support the roof beams. All of this is then stuck onto the side using a pair of brackets which means that uh, everything is really smoothly put together and there are no obvious gaps. The only difference I have done is that some of them use this pyramid shape as the sort of head or beak, uh, some of them use cheese slopes like this, and some of them use the uh, double-sided uh, tent style slopes, uh, just because there is a bit of variety in how these gargoyles look, and I wanted to show that without going too crazy. Okay, so that's it for the Hogwarts micro builds. I am, however, going to do one more thing, which is to take a look at the minifigure stand that I created to show off minifigures in reviews. And here it is. Not strictly Harry Potter related, but I have used it in my Harry Potter reviews, and I think it provides a, uh, a really good effect. Now, this was made just of pieces that I happen to have in my collection, although I did make an effort to give it a sort of united colour scheme, at least in parts. So, for instance, I had enough of these white one by, uh, not one by one, two by two round bricks, as well as white jumpers, um, in order to make the columns where the figures actually stand. And then I tried to keep the rest of it in black as much as possible, with the exception of the plate I'm using as the base. You normally don't see anything below sort of this height, um, and I deliberately constructed this to be as long as possible. So it means when I turn here, both platforms rotate at the same speed and in the same direction. This is a very simple effect just achieved through the use of Technic bevel gears. So those are the gears in here. They're called bevel gears because the teeth are not right angles, they're actually cut off. Um, and that means that they can mesh, um, like you see here, at right angles, which uh, definitely gives us uh, the benefit of being able to change direction very easily. Just got four of them, two on the axle that you spin, and then two which go up into these bricks using Technic axles. I've just got two by two um, round tiles with the holes in the middle to make the action nice and smooth there. And the entire assembly is just supported by one by two Technic bricks with a pinhole so that everything spins freely. At the other end, we've got a four by four round brick. And I've simply used this because it allows me to get the most control and I've stuck a Technic ball joint in each of the four Technic holes, which again, allow me to get a bit better control over how the figures rotate. Obviously when you put things up right close and then rotate, it all looks quite smooth. Um, I probably won't do specific instructions for this. I hope you can, you know, pause the screen and take a look at how it all uh, goes together. In fact, I'll do one from each angle. Incidentally, that is a spare two by two jumper that I use for certain minifigures. I've used it for R2-D2 because it uh, sits better on there um, in the center instead of on two one by two jumpers. So there you have it. Um, if you do have any more questions about this or about any of the other builds in this video, then please do ask and I'll try my best to answer. So there we go, a slightly unusual video. Um, I hope you don't feel cheated uh, that I've included it as a Hogwarts update. I really do think it is because I'm going back in and looking in more detail at things that I've created. 
But have no fear, next Hogwarts update, which should hopefully be coming out on Monday, will be uh, a lot more interesting. And that's because I'm going to look at the next section of Hogwarts, which is what would be in real life the um, transept, one side of the transept of Durham Cathedral. So it will connect on to my central tower build. Also coming very soon will be my review of the Hogwarts Chamber of Secrets set, which hopefully will keep me occupied for quite a while there. So expect a long one. Okay, if you've enjoyed this, then please like, share, subscribe, all the good things that will help me out and help me reach more people, because I just love being able to share everything with you guys. Um, like I said, comment if you've got any questions or any opinions on the stuff I've shown you, and I will do my very best to reply. So I will see you soon, and uh, till then, have a good one. Bye.